Hi everyone, welcome to week three of sociology. This, uh, this week we are talking about the idea of power. This is really important in sociology and as you'll see it fits into a range of different areas that we'll be discussing throughout the semester. So to start us off, I'm going to read a short quote from this week's readings. Uh, this introduces the idea of power. So it says, power can be invisible, it can be fantastic, it can be dull and it can be routine. It can be obvious, it can reach you by the baton of the police, it can speak the language of your thoughts and desires. It can feel like remote control. It can exhilarate like liberation. It can travel through time and it can drown you in the present. It is dense and superficial. It can cause bodily injury and it can harm you without seeming to ever touch you. It is systematic and it is particularistic. It is often both at the same time. It was written by someone called Avery Gordon as I said, it's in this week's readings, so you'll see if you can find it in there. But what you'll notice about this idea is that it's very pervasive. It's in everywhere. It seems to be present all around you in society. It can access you and control you and do things in a range of different ways. And one of the key ideas is about power is that it has an element of control. How, do we, how are we controlled? That'll be one of the ideas I'm going to touch on quickly in this short video. The other main idea is that it brings shape to things. It defines things. Uh, so this is the two ideas that we're going to touch on quickly or focus on in this short video. So power as control and power as defining and bringing shape to something. So the first idea first, power as control. Well for this one I'm going to reference a guy whose name is Max Weber. He's a German man and he was uh, around around the end of the 19th century. And so he thought of power as a possession, as something that is used used to control and to dominate others. And so he described it in this way. This is a quote from him. He says, the chance of a man or a number of men to realize their own will even against the resistance of others. So obviously he's using very gendered language here, uh, but he's talking about the way of controlling others even if they are resisting. And he went on to describe three ways in which we can think about power and the legitimate use of power. So the first way he described is a charismatic form of power. He says it's, uh, you notice this in people who have a certain special quality. Perhaps there's a sacredness to them or they've had some sort of revelation or perhaps they're a hero in one way or another and they have this charisma about them and they, they can control others through this charismatic way of communicating or, or presence. So this is the first idea. But he noted that this approach, this way of having power is very fickle. It can fall apart. You can lose your charisma very suddenly people will no longer follow you. So that was the first idea. The second one, he's described power as coming from tradition, from traditional spaces. And often this is uh, based on loyalty to a position. And so you can think of like monarchies and kingdoms, and people in those positions have a certain power. Um, management, perhaps of your work, is a tradition to respect your boss, but also parents and families. So these structures that we create, these traditions that we have that give certain types of people Power. The third and last one that he described as a, a, a form of legitimate power is a legal, rational form of power. So this is power that comes from our legal systems. And so we're thinking about judges and police, um, people who have a legislative sort of power. So that's the three ways that Max Weber talked about power. And again, that's a power as a possession. It's something that you can hold and then something you can use. So the other way to think about power, and for this one I'm going to reference a guy whose name is Michel Foucault, and he's a French man who lived in the 20th century. So we've got this German way of thinking, this French way of thinking about power. And he described uh, power as a networked technology. And that might sound really strange because in a way it is. It's very different uh, to the you know, power as a possession. Uh, and so the way of thinking that he described came to be kind of typified by this phrase, knowledge is power. We hear that today, often we think about it in ways that sound like you know, the accumulation, gathering more knowledge, perhaps gathering more qualifications, give me power. And that's probably true, but that's a way of thinking about power as a possession, where you're gathering something and then you have power. Instead, he described knowledge as a form of power. This might not be making much sense yet, but let me continue. He's describing in knowing something, we give it shape. 
the information we have about it shapes the thing that we are knowing, what we know and what we don't know. And therefore, the knowledge shapes what's possible, what is, and creates that thing. So knowledge and power are the same thing. Knowledge is power in that sense. This, again, might not be 100% clear to you because it's a complicated concept, but as you read through this week's readings, you'll notice that there's a reference to something called the Panopticon. And Foucault used this um, prison, which is what the Panopticon is. It's a special design for a prison in which uh, the prisoners are always being watched. Now, in modern technology, we know it's not too hard. We have a camera in every room. But this prison was designed uh, so that it was physically possible to see all the prisoners from one given point in the middle of the, the prison. And so they could always be seen, but they couldn't see, see if someone was watching. So they had to assume, they had to assume they were being watched. And so the interesting thing about this style of prison is that the, the prisoners then have to govern themselves. They have to shape themselves and discipline themselves. And this was the language that Foucault came to use about knowledge. He talked about a discipline and then there being disciplines in which knowledge that we gather shapes and disciplines us. You can see the knowledge in that prison shapes the people who are in there. And this design for this prison uh, wasn't, isn't in isolation. Actually, we can see it replicated in our society in a number of different places. And we'll talk more about this in, in the workshop, but we can see the same design where people are able to be watched at all times in things like schools and hospitals uh, and in businesses and, and factories. This idea of surveillance and disciplines is really important and that knowledge can shape us wherever we are. So these are the two ideas uh, about power that we're considering this week and we'll continue to discuss power as we go through this semester, as I've said before, but we want to keep these two ways in mind. Is knowledge, uh, knowledge power and therefore it is something that shapes and gives definition to things or is power something that we hold So as youth workers and as counsellors in this course, I want you to consider a couple more questions. What kind of power do you hold, power and possession? Uh, and what gives you this power? What about your age? What about your gender, your ethnicity, perhaps your qualifications and experience give you some power? And how might this give you more or less power than the people you'd be working with, uh, the young people and your clients? How would your power be different to theirs? Then also think about how are you known? You know, what information is there about you? Uh, how does that shape who you are? Uh, maybe it's self-knowledge, perhaps it's knowledge that you tell others, uh, perhaps it's knowledge stored on somewhere like the internet, on Facebook or social media. And how does this shape you, who you are? And therefore, if you're shaped by knowledge in this way, how are our clients and our young people, how are they shaped by the knowledge about them? So how then should we think about these people? Right, so that's power for this week. Again, just to finish, I'm going to read you this same quote that I started with because I think it's good to revisit it. So, power can be invisible. It can be fantastic. It can be dull and routine. It can be obvious. It can reach you by the baton of the police. It can speak the language of your thoughts and desires. It can feel like remote control. It can exhilarate like liberation. It can travel through time. It can drown you in the presence. It is dense and superficial. It can cause bodily injury, it can harm you without even seeing it touch you. It is systematic, it is particularistic, and it is often both at the same time.